someone who will fix it, but we think we've got to fix it, if you see what I mean. Um, if something drastic goes wrong with your house and you've got the money to pay for it, you could have it done by a top um, roof fixer. But you think I'm going to try and do that yourself first. Then you're going to spend a long time trying to do it and in the end having to turn to the roof fixer and paying even more than what you're going to pay in the first place. We need to learn to do nothing and let the Lord do it. Yeah. Yeah. If you see what I mean. Yeah. It doesn't mean we don't do nothing, but we need to learn to do nothing. Yeah. Um, and another thing I wanted to say, because it was rubbling up inside me and I was sat there. I've been saved now 40 years. Yeah, 40 years. And... I've been to Bible college and theological colleges for seminars. So I must have read the Bible at least 30 times all the way through. At least. It could be more. Okay? I must have. And I'm bragging. What I'm saying is, I'm still looking forward to reading it the 31st yeah. time. Okay? And when I read it the 31st time, I'll find stuff in there that I didn't notice the last 30 times. Yeah. What other book other book can you do that with? You pick up other books and you read them 30 times and you'll see the same thing over and over. In fact, you get bored in the end because you know what the end is and what's that. But with the Bible, for some reason, with the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible always comes up with something new yeah. for a certain time. And people will say to me, well, yeah, but the Bible's thousands of years old. How can that sort of speak to us today? Mm. Well, I'll say this. If someone pinched themselves 2,000 years ago and I pinch myself today, it will feel the same. Mm. If someone loses a partner 2,000 years ago and I lose a partner today, I'll feel the same. See, all our feelings and emotions and things that make us human, the things that make us happy, the things that make us sad, the beating of our hearts, all those things never change. The only difference is we might use a machine gun in a war instead of a sword. Or we might ride a tank into war instead of a horses with a chariot at the back. But it's all the same, it's just different things. So yes, the Bible is as worthy today as it was when it was written, and it'll be as worthy in the next whatever years as it was at the beginning. Now, having said that, we're going to be looking at a subject which I'm really surprised the church hasn't really made much of an issue of, and that's a guy called Mile Kizadek, King and Priest of Salem. Mile Kizadek, King and Priest of Salem. Um, I'm going to read from Hebrews, well, it's going to be up on there, but I'll just tell you where it's from. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. Are we up there? Yeah. Okay. Every high priest, oh, a prayer. Lord, we pray that when we look at your word that you will speak to us, Father. Place things in our hearts, seeds in our hearts, and will bring good fruit in our lives now and in the future. The, bring fruit that other people can eat and feel the blessing from you also. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God 
on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well. As for those of the people, uh, and those are the people, and one who does not presume to take the honour, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. There's that name again, Melchizedek. Jesus was appointed priest in the order of Melchizedek by his father God. Okay, Jesus, believe it or not, wouldn't have um, been able to be a priest if he was around in the Old Testament time, because he wasn't born in the um, livelihood of Aaron. Okay? He had to be born in the life of Aaron, in the ascendant of Aaron, or the Levites, to be a priest. So Jesus, he wasn't qualified to be a priest. Okay? But he was a priest of a higher order. He was a priest of the order of Melchizedek. Now let's find out who Melchizedek is. I'll just go there because otherwise you're going to be turning your Bibles every five minutes. But if you want to go there, um, it's Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 to 24. And this is it. Abraham, blessed by Melchizedek. After his return from the deed of defeat of Shur the Moab, and the kings who were with him. The king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley. And King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. He blessed him and said, Bless be Abram, who becomes Abraham, by God most high, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him one tenth of everything. Then the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, maker of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal or a thong or anything that is yours, so that you might not say, I have made Abraham rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and their share of uh, the battle of Eskil and Mambria. Let them take their share. Now here we have a king called Melchizedek, who's also a priest, and that is an unusual combination because it's normally priests and kings, not the two together. But this, this person is a priest and a king. He's king of the valley of Salem. And the odd thing about it is Abraham actually tithes to him. He gives a tenth of his spoils from the battle against the five kings to Melchizedek. He tithes to him. And Melchizedek brings bread and wine for Abraham and his army. Well, of course, bread and wine alludes to what we have every Sunday or every time we have Eucharist or communion, bread and wine, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this guy is Melchizedek, 
And this guy is the guy that's being talked about in Hebrews and also in Psalm 110, verse 4. Psalm 110, verse 4. Psalm 110 verse 4 Okay Psalm 110 verse 4 Actually I'll start from verse 2 Now The Lord has sworn And will not change his mind You are a priest forever According to the order Of Melchizedek A priest forever According to the order of Melchizedek This is referring to Jesus because this is Psalm 110 and it's the most quoted psalm in the New Testament for a start and secondly Jesus uses this to when he argues against the uh, Sadducees and Pharisees when he says that the Lord says to my Lord sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool and he says who was David talking about when he says the Lord says to my Lord but it was obviously talking about Jesus. My Lord Jesus sits down at the right hand of God the Father. And God the Father says, you are the priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus has been appointed as the priest in the order of Melchizedek. Okay? So he's a king, a priest, and a prophet. And this uh, priesthood that he's been given, he's the only one that's got it. It's an eternal priesthood. It's not a temporal one like the Aaron, Aaron priesthood and the Levi, Levitical priesthood that's in the temple. They die and then someone else has to take over, another Levi, another Aaronite. And also the sacrifices they make on behalf of the people may clean the conscience a little bit, but they do not deal with the sin, the, the sin of mankind. Whereas this priest, Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, he is not only the sacrifice, not only the priest, but also the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Jesus takes away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. And then he dies, he's buried, he's raised from the dead. And when he comes before God, God sits him at his right hand and says, you are the priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now it says in Hebrews that Jesus is in the temple, this is the spiritual temple, with God forever interceding for us. Forever interceding for us. So I'll only talk about where it says in um, that Jesus prayed for himself for his disciples and for those who become disciples and for those who become disciples right away to us so he's praying and covering us at all times and we're, so we know even if we're on our own there's no one else there Jesus is there with us and his prayer is covering us and when it says that he intercedes forever on our behalf before God that means he's also still praying for us, yeah. still covering us in his prayer, Amen. and still has us in his hands. Jesus. And that's why it's hard not to do nothing and to trust in that. Yeah. But anyway, um, let's see where we're going to go next. Jesus, right, okay. Chapter 7 of Hebrews I'm going to now. The priestly order of Melchizedek. Okay, chapter 7, verse 1. This king Melchizedek of Salem, by the way, Salem was Jerusalem before it was Salem, before it was Jerusalem, it was Salem. And then when David conquered that area, he called it Jerusalem and he built the temple upon it and, you know, or well, Solomon did, and that became the place where God is, the place of peace, okay, the place of salvation. Jerusalem. This king Melchizedek of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham as he was returning from defeating the kings and blessed him. Now this is the writer of the Hebrews referring to that incident we read about in Genesis. Okay? 
and to him Abraham apportioned one tenth of everything. His name in the first place means king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means. Next, he is also king of Salem, that is the king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, who remains a priest forever. Now who do we know that is without father, without mother, is forever, um, and all the things that are mentioned here, no genealogy, who do we know? Jesus, he's the only one, okay? And here he is, as Melchizedek, the king of Salem and priest, in an eternal priesthood, okay? We are not without a priesthood. We are priests ourselves, spiritual priests, called into the church. And our high priest is Jesus in the order of Melchizedek. Okay? That's what Hebrews teaches us. Um, verse 23 of um, 7. Well, actually, no, I'm going to go up the top first to verse... 17. For it is attested of him, that's Jesus, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Then we go further down, and we're at 21. The Lord has sworn, and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Accordingly, Jesus has also become the guarantee of a better covenant. Right? There was a promise of a new covenant. And Jesus is the man that implemented that new covenant and continues to implement it and continues to make sure that it does what it has to do. And we are all members of that new covenant. And he is a priest forever. He's our high priest forever. Okay? So, let's remember, we've got someone in heaven, a man in heaven, who's a high priest, who was sacrificed, who is the Lamb of God, who is the temple, who is all those things. He's the priest, he's everything. And he sticks up for us, basically. He, he, he wants us to, be, to go and be with him in that place forever. 23. Furthermore, the former priests were many in number, because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, that's Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him since he is always lives to make intercession for them, which means us. Okay, right. So this guy here, he saves those who approach God through him, that's Jesus, and he intercedes for them forever. He's never not interceding. You could be on a, a, an island on your own. You could be starving to death. You could find no food. But he is still interceding for you. He's still there. You could be on the top of a mountain, and he is interceding for you. You could be in the grave, and he's still interceding for you. It says that very clearly. You go to the top of the man and you are there. I go to the grave and you are there. He is interceding. Now how does he know what it's like to be in the grave? Well, we know he does because he died on the cross and he was put in one, just like we will be at one time in our lives. But he also knows what it's like to be called out of the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit and to be at the right hand of God and to be interceding for us and to pour out his Holy Spirit on his church. Today, in church um, diaries, it's um, the day of Pentecost. And of course, that day was the day when Jesus and God poured out their spirit upon the believers, and they became empowered and became the new church. And at that point, the old was gone, the old thing was abrogated, and the new church began. And we know that because the temple was destroyed by the Romans. And once the temple was destroyed by the Romans, 
There was no more Levitical priesthood. There was no more Aaronic priesthood. There was no more sacrifices. There was no more bringing your offerings to the temple. All that was gone. It was destroyed because the new temple is Jesus. And how do I know that? Well, because Jesus is in that temple and he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. And the Pharisees and the, well, the, the priesthood at the time, they were saying, oh, yeah, right, we've taken 76 years to build this and it's not even finished yet. And then it says underneath, but when Jesus was raised from the dead, the disciples knew that he was talking about himself. Destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. He was risen in three days. He was crucified. His temple was crucified. This sacrifice lamb was crucified. This priest was crucified. This king was crucified. And then was buried and raised from the dead. So the old um, real um, flesh and blood stone and cement temple was completely destroyed and raised to the ground. Burned to the ground by the Romans. And the Jews ever since for the last 2,000 years have been planning and rebuilding that temple. It's never happened. But what we're waiting for is the finality of the building of the spiritual temple. And that's the church. It says, and I'll finish now because I'm going to go on forever, and it says that the spiritual temple is made up of spiritual stones, not boulders or cement, spiritual stones, living stones. And who are those living stones? You and me. You and me. We're all living stones, and we're all being built together as the temple of God. And who is going to be the priest serving in that temple? Jesus is. Jesus lives in that temple. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this temple is going to be not a temporary temple that gets destroyed by the Romans, but a forever eternal temple that never gets destroyed. And when the spiritual temple comes down from heaven and comes to earth, which it says in Revelation, there'll be no sun and moon. We don't need sun and moon then because we're living God's light. Any light will be of God. There'll be nothing like that. There'll be us, God, Jesus, and all of the beings that are in that eternal place. There's, remember there's cherubim and seraphim and archangels, all sorts of different beings. And cherubim are not little babies with wings, by the way, where you get on postcards, no. They are very, very powerful beings. Read about them in Ezekiel and in Revelation. You wouldn't like to come across one and be their enemy. Let's say that. So all those things are waiting for us. All those things have been promised to us in the power of the Holy Spirit. All those things we're being raised for. To meet Jesus in the air on that day when we're raptured and taken into God's holy home to become the bride of Christ. Yes, the bride. Remember I said this last week, for all the feminists here, I have to swallow the fact that I'm part of the bride of Christ. I'm the feminine side of the relationship with Jesus. Right? And so do all us men. We're all part of the bride of Christ and we've got no problem with that at all. Okay? So, let's finish there. I'll pray. Of which, by the way, there's three more chapters of Mark in there, so I suggest you go and read them because I was never going to cover them in that time. Okay. 7, 8, 9, and 10 in Hebrews. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have a high priest in heaven, a high priest who is eternal, a high priest who never dies, a high priest who has made the one last final sacrifice, the high priest who's poured out his blood for the last time. We don't need to bring sheep and, and uh, goats and chickens and pigeons and all those kind of things anymore. We don't need to pour their blood out on our behalf because Jesus had done that once and for all on the cross. And we thank you that he continues to intercede for us. 
and then let's pray Lord that we can all remember that in times of trouble and in times of good as well Father that we have a high priest a man in heaven praying and interceding on our behalf in Jesus' name without no sin Amen, Amen. Amen. Amen.